everyone, it's Clayton and Hannah. Happy Sunday, we hope you enjoy the service. Hey everyone, I'm Lydia Petty. I'm the Liberty Kids Coordinator. Welcome to our online service. What's your name? Grace. <laughs> uh, we will be starting in just a few moments. Uh, if you want to drop a prayer request or just say hi and chat below, that would be great. Enjoy the service. Miss you guys. Hey everyone, this is Tony and Brett. We lead the Lower Bucks Home Meeting. Welcome to our online service. The service will begin shortly. While you wait, say hi or drop a prayer request in the comments below. Enjoy the service. everyone, my name is Serlin. I'm part of the care team at Liberty Northeast. This is Judah. This is Zeke. We just wanted to say hi and welcome you to our online service. We are so glad you're here. Thanks so much for joining us. Can you say bye? Bye. Can you wave? Bye bye.
Hey everyone, it's Clayton and Hannah. Happy Sunday. We hope you enjoy the service. Hi, I'm Courtney, First Impressions Coordinator here at Liberty Northeast. Thanks for joining our online service today. It'll begin shortly. We're excited to have you. While you wait, feel free to join the live chat below and say hi to one another. We hope you enjoy the service. Hey everyone, I'm Lydia Petty. I'm the Liberty Kids Coordinator. Welcome to our online service. What's your name? Grace. <laughs> uh, we will be starting in just a few moments. Uh, if you want to drop a prayer request or just say hi and tap hello, that would be great. Enjoy the service. Miss you guys. Hey everyone, this is Tony and Brett. We lead the Lower Bucks Home Meeting. Welcome to our online service. The service will begin shortly. While you wait, say hi or drop a prayer request in the comments below. Enjoy the service.
Hey, good morning. Welcome to Liberty Northeast. My name is Pastor Evan. Thank you so much for tuning in with us this morning, particularly if you're new or visiting. I invite you to engage with us. We're very excited that you're joining us this morning, but I invite you to engage with us by texting us at 215-650-8092, 215-650-8092. That gives you opportunity to ask any questions about the church, uh, to uh, get, ask for a prayer, find out how to give, whatever it may be, we're happy to engage you that way. Uh, this morning, we have the opportunity as well to have Pastor John Alexander from Liberty River Wards preach to us this morning on Psalm 119. We're really excited about that. Thankful that he gave us the opportunity. Uh, he jumped in this week to preach on that for us. And I also want to just continue to em encourage you and invite you to share online when you're doing these online services. It's a great way to invite people in as they're sitting at home to remind them of the gospel and what's important in their lives. And after the service today, online, we will go to Klein Life and on the fields, we will take communion together. So that's a really exciting thing. And we'll sing some worship songs and pray together as well. But before we begin, I just want to pray for us. And I invite you to settle your hearts and lift them up to the Lord. Father, we are so grateful for you and for what you've done for us. Thank you for sending Jesus for us, dying that he would die for our sins, and that you rose him again on the third day so that we could spend eternity with you and we can serve you here on this earth and spend the next life with you. We praise you for that. We celebrate that, Lord. And we thank you for him. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. Hey, I'm now going to do our call to worship, which comes from Psalm 9, verse 1 through 2. I'm going to read the plain text. I invite you to respond with the underlined. We will give thanks to you, O Lord, with our whole heart. We will tell all of all your wonderful deeds. We will be glad and exult in you. We will sing praise to your name, O Most High. Amen. I invite you now to sing the song of praise with us. Worthy of every song we could ever sing Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe We live for you Jesus, the name above every other name Jesus, the only one who could ever save Worthy of every breath who could ever breathe we live for you, oh, we live for you. Holy, there is no one like you. There is none beside you. Open up my eyes in one. Show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in love to those around me Jesus the name above every other name Jesus the only one who could ever save worthy of every breath we could ever breathe we live for you oh we live for you Holy, there is no one like you, there is none beside you. Open up my eyes in one, show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around. Oh, 
filled my life upon your love. It is a firm foundation. I will put my trust in you alone, and I will not be shaken. I will build my life upon your love. It is a firm foundation. I will put my trust in you alone, and I Northeast family. This is Pastor John Alexander from Liberty Church of the River Wards down in the Fishtown, Kensington, Port Richmond, Northern Liberties area. It's great to be with you. I know many of you. I love many of you. And for those of you I don't know, it's really great to be with you sharing the Word of God. And today we're going to look at Psalm 119. And we're going to look at verse 1, then jump to verses 25 through 40, and then read the very final verse of Psalm 119, which is verse 176. So it's a long one. We're not going to read all of it, just those verses. Hear these words from the book that we love. Verse 1. Blessed are those whose way is blameless, who walk in the law of the Lord. Then beginning verse 25. My soul clings to the dust. Give me life according to your word. When I told of my ways, you answered me. Teach me your statutes. Make me understand the way of your precepts, and I will meditate on your wondrous works. My soul melts away for sorrow. Strengthen me according to your word. Put false ways far from me and graciously teach me your law. I have chosen the way of faithfulness. I set your rules before me. I cling to your testimonies, O Lord. Let me not be put to shame. I will run in the way of your commandments when you enlarge my heart. Teach me, O Lord, the way of your statutes, and I will keep it to the end. Give me understanding that I may keep your law and observe it with my whole heart. Lead me in the path of your commandments, for I delight in it. Incline my heart to your testimonies and not to selfish gain. Turn my eyes from looking at worthless things and give me life in your ways. Confirm to your servant your promise that you may be feared. Turn away the reproach that I tread, for your rules are good. Behold, I long for your precepts. In your righteousness, give me life. And then verse 176. I have gone astray like a lost sheep. Seek your servant, for I do not forget your commandments. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Did you ever wake up in the morning and immediately, as soon as you wake up, you are aware of the goodness of God in creation and you want to give him thanks for his goodness. And you also, when you, as soon as you wake up, you have a, an awareness of the gospel, that it's true. And you have security, of, security in your identity in Christ. You know you're God's beloved child and nothing can change that because of the work of Christ on your behalf. And more than that, you're ready to go out into the world based on this identity that you're loved by God through Christ and 
you're ready fearlessly to love the world. Do you know what I mean? Do you know that feeling as soon as you wake up in the morning? Neither do I. I got to tell you, I have never consistently just woken up and had this feeling, this posture with me. If I wake up fully ready to pray or fully ready to encounter God, like in a number of days on a stretch, let's say, it's often because I'm in a lot of pain or because I'm scared. And I, I, I have an awareness of my need to rely on him in a, in a unique way. And I've actually spoken to a lot of people in our congregation the past few weeks, an unusual number of people in our congregation who have said things like, I, I'm as dry as I've ever been spiritually. One guy said to me, I find it truly unpleasant to pray. Another person said, you know, it's not that I disagree with any particular doctrine or I've come to change my view of anything spiritually, say, compared to last year or five years ago. It's just there's nothing there in terms of heart. If this is where you are, and it is where I have been not that long ago, I mean, certainly days in the past few months, in longer seasons, at different times in my own spiritual journey, if this is where you are, this passage of scripture is for you. Maybe if you're in a place like some of these other uh, men and women I've encountered in our congregation over the past few weeks and months, if, if you relate to what they're saying and you can maybe pray nothing else, I wonder if you can pray these words that have been tremendously useful for me. And I wonder if it would be helpful, not least, because it becomes clear that often the writers of Scripture felt exactly the same way. And interestingly enough, these verses that I'm going to offer you this morning are found in the longest chapter in the Bible, and that's Psalm 119. I want to start by just looking at the first and last verses of the psalm, verse 1 and verse 176. So this is going to be a, a a sermon where it'll be particularly useful to have the scriptures in front of you. The first verse, blessed are those whose way is blameless, who walk in the law of the Lord. Really set the pace for the whole song. Blessed is the first word, and if that sounds like a real churchy spiritual word, blessed in the biblical sense means something like satisfied and secure in God. That's what it means to be blessed. And who are blessed? Those whose way is blameless, who walk in the law of the Lord. Now, the word law in Hebrew is the word Torah. And when you and I hear the word law, we usually think of rules right away. And it certainly includes that. As we work through these 176 verses, we're not going to go through them all today. But if you were to read the entire psalm, you know that the, the word rules come up a lot. Because it's a whole psalm about the law of God. But you'd also find out very quickly that the law involves a lot more than rules. Every concept you can think of relating to the Hebrew Torah, or law of Moses, is used. Precepts, rules, regulations. But in describing the law, it also uses words like testimonies and the works of God. Probably a better uh, understanding of the word law for us is something like instruction. Knowledge of the way of God. All that God has revealed to us about himself including the story of all that he's done in our lives. Blessed are those who walk in the instruction of God with all that he's told us about himself in view. That's the first verse. Let's jump to the last verse. This is where the psalmist, who wrote the longest chapter in our scriptures about the beauty and the wonder of the instruction of God, this is how the psalmist ends the longest chapter in the Bible. Read with me, verse 176. I have gone astray like a lost sheep. Seek your servant, for I do not forget your commandments. So, I'm lost, is how the psalm ends. And I need you, God, to come seek and find me. Like a good shepherd finds a lost sheep. And you'll see, it's not because 
all of the law of God is, is lost on me. It's not because I've forgotten it all. It's not that I don't have the right information. Knowledge isn't the problem. And keep this in mind sometimes when you go, go to minister or befriend someone, particularly a friend in the household of faith who's really struggling with a complete lack of zeal. More often than not, knowledge is not the problem. So what is the problem? There's no there there. There's no zeal. There's no unction. There's something that needs to be made alive to make use of the wonderful things that I know so that I can draw near. And unless God helps me do that at the end of the day, at the end of 176 verses proclaiming the beauty of God's law, unless God shows up and moves it from here to here to make me alive, I'm lost. I'm like a sheep in a dangerous wilderness without a good shepherd. Do you relate to that? This is a psalm for those who know the instruction and promises of God, but cannot live them out as hard as they try and can't necessarily even want to want to live them out. And your only hope is in God to help you. The question kind of comes then, Okay, if it's all on God to help me even want to follow him, and that really does seem to be uh, how the psalm ends, what's required of me? These are the two points that uh, I'm going to give you as we briefly look through some, some verses in the heart of this psalm. If you find yourself lost to even want to follow God, and knowledge isn't the problem, what's God's work in this stuckness, and what's yours? Those are our two points. What's God's work and what's yours in your spiritual stuckness? First, what's God's work? Dive in with me again at verse 25. Um, These are two stanzas, verse 25 through 32, and then verses 33 through 40 in the heart of this psalm that really highlight the tension that runs all the way through the psalm. Your law is beautiful, but I still, I know it, but I don't know it. I need, I, 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 it's been taught to me over and over and over again, 176 verses worth, but it's not been taught to me. I know, but I don't know. Help me. Just look at the verbs beginning in verse 25. My soul clings to the dust. This is a, this is a image of death. Dust is an image of death in the scriptures. Give me life according to your word. This is resurrection language and it's, it's not the last time even in these two stanzas, of two of 22 stanzas in the psalm as a whole, where the psalmist says, I need you to give me life or I'm hopeless to access your word at all. Look at the ongoing verbs attributed to God, not us, in our spiritual struggle. Verse 26, you teach me your statues. You make me understand the way of your precepts and then I'll meditate on your wondrous works. Verse 28, you strengthen me according to your word. Verse 29, you put false ways far from me and graciously teach me your law, as in I can't do it by myself. Verses 30 and 31 are the exceptions, and we're going to come back to them. Then verse 32, I will run in the way of your commandments, but not until what? Until you enlarge my heart, otherwise I cannot do it. Verse 33, you teach me the way of your statutes, and then I'll keep them. You give me understanding, and then I'll keep your law and observe it. You lead me. You incline, verse 36, my heart to your testimonies. Verse 37, you turn my eyes. I can't do it myself. Again, in verse 37, you give me life in your ways. Verse 38, you confirm your servant to your promise. I can't just hear it and make it make myself alive apart from the power of your spirit. Verse 39, turn away the reproach that I dread. And verse 40, in your righteousness, give me life. There it is again, the point. The point is that the power to follow God's beautiful way, the power to obey, the power to repent, the power to change is not something I find within myself alone. Let's look back again at verse 30 and 31, which I mentioned before, are kind of the exceptions in these two stanzas of this greater theme. It says, I have chosen the way of faithfulness and set your rules before me. I cling to your testimonies. 
These are verbs that the psalmist is saying, I've got them before me. I've chosen them and not some other way. I see that there is goodness here and not in false ways, but these are not yet the verbs of walking, of running, of observing, of keeping, and certainly not of resurrection. And this has been true of my life many times. It's certainly true of a lot of people. It's not like they want to leave the church necessarily, although some of them perhaps are, are, are pondering it seriously. They see beauty here, but it's not like they're walking with the lover of their souls. Let me ask you, do you believe that this is true? Do you believe that the power to follow God's beautiful way, the power to obey, the power to repent, is not something you find within yourself alone? Do you believe that that's true? Maybe you don't. Maybe you don't believe this. Maybe, maybe you don't believe that if you see some change in your life, if you can look at any development, any hope, any restored joy after it's been lost for a while, maybe you look at that in your life uh, and, and you don't necessarily see the work of God. This scripture seems to be teaching us that if that happens, if that happens in your life, it's not that you're a bystander, that you're somehow not involved. And we're going to get to that in a moment when we go to our work, which comes alongside God's work. You're not a bystander, but when the change comes, you have only God to thank for it. I, I have encountered a lot of people in our church, but also just in, in our neighborhoods here in Philadelphia, who think that change pretty much is just exclusively on them. My first thought is maybe they are just more functional people than this psalmist is. They're certainly must have or believe that they have a lot more inherent spiritual power than this writer of the scriptures had. But it's more likely that there's some target moving going on in their life. Like they really think that change is on them alone and that when it happens, they're able to congratulate themselves for it. There's some target moving going on. What do I mean by target moving? Well, if you've ever seen the old Disney version of the movie Robin Hood, there's a famous classic scene where there's an archery contest and a disguised Robin Hood comes and he's shooting the arrow and there's all these other uh, villagers who come and they're shooting arrows at targets and trying to win uh, the, the prize for the best archer. And the Sheriff of Nottingham, who's the bad guy, is there alongside a disguised Robin Hood and he's shooting his arrows as well at the target, but he's got this little henchman who's hidden inside of a haystack. He's like this cartoon vulture. He's hidden in the haystack and the target's on the front of the haystack. And the vulture keeps hopping up so that when the arrow is off, the target moves to get the bullseye. I think we do this a lot. When we look at ourselves and say, I, I feel able to keep the instruction of God pretty well. I, I think, and on my own steam, and by my own volition, by my own unction, by my own get-go, there is not a necessary reliance on another. Probably what's going on is that I am looking at my life and seeing ways that I think I'm pretty good and moving the target of God's instruction to see myself hitting the bullseye, when in fact that I'm not. I'm not meeting the expectation of Jesus' summary of the law in his two great commandments. Love the Lord God with heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. And let's say for a second that it was possible to do that perfectly in the way that only Jesus did. Love God with heart, soul, mind, and strength, and then love my neighbor as myself. If at the outset, though, of trying to obey those commandments, I'm doing it on my own steam, to obey the law of God on my own as a personal endeavor without him, I'm off point before I even begin because I was made for walking with God. Those commandments inherent to them is doing them in fellowship with God. So of course, no one was ever intended to obey any law of God apart from walking on a journey with him 
in reliance on him. So I want to give you this bit of good news if you're someone who has no zeal in your heart. Here's at least what you have. You have the knowledge that you can't get better. You can't fully thrive spiritually unless he shows up. And not all Christians know that. And that means they're sleepwalking. Living righteously and faithfully in the world is not something you do by your own strength. But more than this, you're not alone even in being roused to care enough to follow him. He's involved in that work too. So great. That's God's work. What's ours then? What falls for us to do? That's the second point. If all that is true, if these scriptures are true, if these are prayers that we need, then what falls to us? Well, let me just ask you this. When you listen to this psalmist saying over and over and over again, I need you to make me understand. I need you to strengthen me. You teach me. You set your rules before me. You give me life. You enlarge my heart. What falls to me? Does the psalmist seem lazy? Let me just ask you that question. Does the psalmist seem lazy? Like he's just sitting back and saying, it's all on you, God. Whatever. No. Let me give you a parallel. And this is a parallel about some of my heroes in our church. If you know anybody in a 12-step program, and some of the people who go to these 12-step programs, whether it's AA or NA or SA or Overeaters Anonymous, you go, say, weekly, multiple times a week. Some go every day. And the first several steps in 12-step programs are founded on the premise that I cannot change myself on my own. You go to one of those meetings and you do not get the feeling that anyone in the room is lazy. I mean, maybe there's some relative differences between motivation in the room, but some of those folks are longing, hoping, and certainly showing up like no one else I know based on the premise that they cannot help themselves. What is going on? It's a showing up to be strengthened. It's a showing up to be strengthened. I want to give you three things, just three very clear things that we can do with him. Three ways that we show up to be strengthened for the journey to be loved by him, to love him back through Christ, and to love our neighbor as ourselves, which is why we're here, right? That's, that is the purpose for our existence, to love God in response to him who loved us, be loved by him, love him back, and love others. Three things you can do to be strengthened by him on that journey. First, believe. Now, you can overthink this. Um, isn't he involved even in helping us believe? Yeah, yeah, but there's so many things like this in our, in our faith. Uh, we're called by God to choose him. So, okay, I choose him, but then I look back and I say, well, did I choose him or was I chosen? And the answer is yes. Yes, both. Believe. Believe. You're still listening, maybe. <laughs> you know, whatever, 19-some minutes in. You're still listening. That means there is a speck of faith there. Lean into it. Lean into it. Believing that he means to help you, lean into it. Uh, St. Augustine, in his letters, has this wonderful phrase, Lord, help me to accomplish what you require of me. Lord, help me to accomplish what you require of me. In a more expanded version, um, I came across this passage uh, in a book called Free to Be by a, a writer who recently died named Gerard Ford, who basically put that phrase, Lord, help me to accomplish what you require. Help me show up to be strengthened by you. He put it in a really beautiful way, and I'd love if you'd listen along and see if you recognize any of your journey in this. This is what Gerard Ford writes. 
He says, God has made a decision about you. God made this decision knowing full well the kind of person you are. He knows you inside and out, upside down and backwards. He knows where you are strong and where you're weak, what you're most proud of and what you would most like to hide. Be that as it may, God's decision is made. This is the decision. God has decided to be your God. For God wants to be as close to you as your next breath, to be the one who gives you confidence and value, to open a future to you in the freedom of the word. God wants to be the one to whom you turn for whatever you need. He first announced this decision about you when you were baptized. You, God said, are baptized in my name. I am your God. I will never let you go. It is the God who made everything that is, the God who raised Jesus of Nazareth from the dead after he had been put to death on a cross. The one whose spirit came like a mighty wind to drive home a word that gives forgiveness and hope. God's decision is the life of you. And when this God says, I am your God, you can expect him to give you everything you need to live. The God who has decided for you is the one who opened the grave the first Easter morning, the God who raises the dead. So when this God says, I am your God, the am stands forever. He is, was, and always will be your God. So no grave will ever be able to hold you. In the silence of death, you will hear Jesus' voice saying, rise and shine, I am the Lord your God. God's decision opens your future. End quote. Give me life according to your word indeed. As we read again and again in Psalm 119. Believe. Believe. That's the first point. And much more briefly, second and thirdly. Secondly is prayer. Believe but pray and turn in prayer. This is, this is the imagery for change in the scriptures. It's repent. It's a turning of heart and a turning of head and a turning of action. A turning of heart and mind that leads to a turning of action. And sometimes a turning of action that leads to a turning of heart and mind. Can I ask you if you relate to any of those folks I described earlier who feel dry, find prayer unpleasant, find no unction or zeal in their relationship with the Lord. Have you asked God about it at all? These are beautiful words to memorize. Psalm 119, 25 through 40. Enlarge my heart so I can run in the way of your commandments. You turn me from false ways. You turn my eyes. You can Firm your promises to me. Have you even prayed? You are praying the impossible, but he's the God of the impossible. So those are the first two. Believe and pray. And finally, walk. Walk. There's no getting around it. And again, we don't want to overthink it. Who's walking here? Is he pulling me or am I walking? But as you read these words tonight, tomorrow, as I encourage you to do, as you memorize them, believing that he strengthens you, leaning into him by turning to him in prayer, simply try to walk. Simply try to walk with him, reading his word, coming alongside someone who you think Jesus would really care about, which is anybody, but maybe, let's say, the most forgotten person that you pass on a given day the weak, the lonely. Walk alongside them with the love with which you've been loved or that you perceive in the scriptures. Give to another who has less. Be a friend in Jesus' name. Mourn with those who mourn. Arrange your life in a way that makes you as peaceable of a person as possible 
while also clinging as best you can ruthlessly to truth. Walk. Believing and praying. I know these things sound simple, but doing it with confidence that he's with you and you do it by his strength is everything. And more often than not, when I talk to people who are in this place, they've been trying to walk without believing or praying. Or without, without going to the psalmist who is in the dust and learning of the writers of Holy Scripture what they did when they found themselves there. Brothers and sisters, you don't grow alone. All change, all change, and please, if you've heard nothing else that I've said, hear this. All change is turning back to the lover of your soul who is mighty to save and strengthen you. If you're not turning to God, it is not the change that you want. And right now, a lot of people in our culture are screaming at individuals and people groups to change. And we're actually going to go there more and more throughout the summer for our church. Um, But if it's the change you want, if it's the change that God wants for you, It is always a turning to him. It works no other way. If you're not turning to him, it is not the change that he wants, and it must not be the change that you want for yourself. You don't grow alone. Praise God through Jesus. You don't grow alone. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. We now come to the part of our service where we confess our sins to God. Sin is any way in which you rebelled or resisted against God in your life. And so we do that corporately. The Bible does talk about corporate sin and it talks about individual sin. So we need to do both. We need to confess both to God. And so let's say this prayer confession. It will be on your screen. I invite you to say it out loud with me. Merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart and mind and strength. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. In your mercy, forgive what we have been, help us amend what we are, and direct what we shall be, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Take a moment to silently confess your sins to God. Look up and hear these words of encouragement from Psalm 32, 3 through 5. When I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night, your hand was heavy on me. My strength was sapped as in the heat of summer. Then I acknowledged my sin to you and did not cover up my iniquity. I said, I confess my transgressions to the Lord and you forgave the guilt of my sin. When we confess our sins, God forgives us our guilt. Amen. Hey, this would be the time in our service normally we would pass the offering baskets, but right now we aren't able to do that because we're meeting online. So you can definitely give online by going to libertynortheast.org slash give, and you can mail in a check. You can text us to give. There's a number of ways to do that. Just you will be able to see those on your screen. So as you're thinking about that, I invite you to sing this final song. People come together Strangers, neighbors Our blood is one The children of generations Of every nation Of kingdom come So don't let your heart be troubled Hold your head up high, don't fear no evil Fix your eyes on this one truth God is madly in love with you Take courage, hold on, be strong Remember where our help comes from Salvation, 
Hey, thanks so much for joining us this morning. Thank you, Pastor John, for uh, doing our sermon today and giving me a week off. Really appreciate that. Appreciate you so much. And I uh, just wanted to pronounce this blessing on you and your children before you go. But before I do, I want to invite you to text us if you're new at 215-650-8092. 215-650-8092. We hope to engage with you and talk with you and chat with you through text messaging today. And as I send you out, I invite you to receive this blessing with open hands. This comes from Numbers chapter 6. It's a classic blessing that the church and Israel has used for years. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Amen. Have a great week. Hope to see you soon. Swing wide, all you have fans. Let the praise go up as the walls come down. All creation, everything with breath, repeat the sound. All his children, clean hands, pure hearts, good grace, good God. His name is Jesus. Swing wide, all you have Let the praise go up as the walls come down. All creation, everything with breath, repeat the sound. All his children, clean hands, pure hearts, good grace, good God. His name is Jesus. Swing wide, all you have let the praise go up as the walls come down. All creation, everything with breath, repeat the sound. All is chill.